Hey, so did anybody else hear about that new Avengers movie? It's finally over. The decade of Avengers stuff. I know they say they're making more, but like, come on, they didn't name it Endgame for nothing. I mean, like, yeah, I liked it, but let's be honest with ourselves. We all knew I walked into this movie knowing I was gonna like it. But like, come on, just look at that climactic scene at the end. Spoilers, by the way, but I think that that final scene with the portals is really, really good. Controversial hot take, I know. And the thing that I especially liked about it is that the music is doing something really, really cool. Now that's not to say that the music in Endgame isn't cool in general. Like, we get a return of this heroic sacrifice music when Tony snaps his fingers. We get the same music for Black Widow that we got for Gamora when they both got thrown off that cliff. And the music that plays when Cap dances with What's-Her-Face is the exact same as what he was listening to in Winter Soldier. <laughs> There's a ton of really cool musical moments in this film, I'm not dismissing that, but this scene just kind of like, it feels like they turned it up to 11, you know? Like, two things. One, it almost feels like this could be this generation's No, I Am Your Father, you know? Like, it feels like people are going to be referencing this for a long time. And two, I don't think I listened to it right. As in, I didn't hear what I was supposed to, uh, like I didn't music good. Now, I know what you're thinking, and no, I didn't have a stroke, I think. I mean it when I say it, I don't think I heard it correctly. I listened to this film wrong. I was incorrectly listening to the music. And your gut reaction to hearing somebody say something like that might be, what are you talking about? How do you listen to music wrong? Music is subjective. Isn't beauty in the eye of the beholder? And all that other kind of stuff. And yeah, sure, that's right, but eh, I'm just going to be a pain in the butt for a little while here. See, I like to analyze music in a bubble, in its own closed system, which is fine and all, sort of. I mean, I come from a very hard Western European music background, and when you're looking at something from that very specific common practice period, applying those common practice period techniques is pretty standard stuff. But in truth, out there in the real world, no music exists in a bubble. All music everywhere is constantly building on itself and developing as time goes on. And as a listener, whether you mean to or not, as music morphs over time, you're going to develop certain associations with specific patterns in music. You can go as far as to say as their musical tropes or cliches, but in truth, there are a bunch of musical patterns that everyone's familiar with, but doesn't tend to consciously think about. Let me give you an example. Why do we hear what we hear right here? Just name your price and I'll pay it. Yeah, I bet you would. Have you ever sat down and thought about what makes the saxophone sound so, well, sexual? Chances are that you're probably thinking it has something to do with like careless whisper or something like that, right? <laughs> Okay, but why did Careless Whisper feature a sax solo in the first place? And why does that sax solo sound so... romantic? Well, saxophones have always existed in the popular music sphere because all popular music stemmed from rock and roll in the 1950s, which itself was a response to blues. So naturally you're gonna see and hear jazz horns all over the place, especially in anything that's even remotely adjacent to pop music. But that doesn't really address the sexuality of the saxophone. Well, in earnest, to get to there, you're probably going to have to look at the 1951 film A Streetcar Named Desire, where composer Alex North used jazz to highlight urban settings as well as all the non-PG-13 stuff. Be comfortable, that's my motto up where I come from. It's mine too. It's hard to stay looking fresh in hot weather where I haven't washed or even powdered. Here you are. Well, you know, you gotta be careful. But why did he do that? Well, back in the 1920s, basically all jazz existed in clubs and dance halls. That big band swing was just dance music, more or less. And if you want more detail on this, you can check out one of my other videos that I'll link in the description. But during this time period, people like Henry Ford started blaming black people and jazz and dance halls for all the problems that were arising due to rapid urban development, even though all of that was really Henry Ford's fault. There's a common stereotype that these dance halls led to alcohol and drugs and the devil and all that kind of stuff that makes suburbanites nervous. 
But this stereotype was a massive component of how people perceived jazz for the next few decades. So North here used that jazzy sound function as a kind of shortcut to mean any sort of urban environment. And after years and years of referencing that kind of sound, we've developed the collective shortcut for this kind of saxophone music to mean something, well, not PG-13. So that's kind of an example of how and why certain things sound a certain way and how that develops and changes over time. But that's just like how tropes and cliches work. People build off of common associations over time and they slowly morph and develop new meanings. And this isn't exactly exclusive to music that exists everywhere in the art world. It's just how things naturally develop over the years. And when you're writing music for some kind of media, it's a great way to convey a lot of information in a short amount of time. That is assuming that you and your audience are on the same wavelength and you both have that same musical association. Cause like, what happens when you, the listener, misinterpret the composer's message? What if the composer intended one thing, but you heard something completely different? Well, let's bring it back to the Avengers. One of my favorite themes in the MCU is Ant-Man's theme. <laughs> But why does Ant-Man's theme sound the way that it does? Well, what is Ant-Man? In essence, he's just a burglar. And when you look at this film as a whole, it's really just a heist film. And what do heist films sound like? Well, what are some classic heist films? James Bond and Mission Impossible, right? James Bond has that classic jazzy sound that we all know and love, and Mission Impossible has that infectiously catchy rhythmic ostinato, that repeating pattern. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> But you see, there's something a little more unique about the main theme for Mission Impossible. It's in 5-4. I'm not going to get into how time signatures work in much detail. Just know that like 95% of all the music that you'll ever listen to is in 4-4. Just 1, 2, 3, 4. Like everything. And then another like 3% is in 3-4. Just think of anything that sounds like a waltz. And then the last 2% is in 6-8, which is basically anything that sounds like a pirate or like it should be played at a Ren fair. And yeah, we could sit here all day and explain why a lot of people have those associations with those time signatures, and we could spend another hour talking about which are simple or compound or duple or triple meter. And don't make me break out the 9-8. I'll do it. I don't give a crap. Anyway, 99.5% of all the music most people will have listened to will be in one of these time signatures, which are considered to be symmetrical. But Mission Impossible is in 5-4, which is considered to be asymmetrical. It isn't super balanced. You can almost feel like it's falling over itself. <laughs> it gives this piece momentum. Using this kind of asymmetrical meter helps give your piece a driving motion. And so when we get to Ant-Man, composer Christoph Beck elicited that asymmetrical time signature because Ant-Man's theme is in 7-8. So if you're really familiar with the Mission Impossible theme, and it's arguably one of the most popular melodies that most people will know that's in an asymmetrical time signature, then there's a good chance that you're going to create some kind of subconscious musical shortcut between Ant-Man and Mission Impossible. Now if you add that jazzy James Bond instrumentation... <laughs> And bam, all of a sudden, Ant-Man's going to start feeling more like that heist guy without you ever knowing it. But here's the thing. What if you're an idiot like me and you've never really seen a James Bond or Mission Impossible movie? I remember seeing one when I was a kid that had that guy from Mamma Mia in it and another one with a blonde guy in it, but like, it felt like it was making a lot of references that I didn't pick up on. And I only ever saw Mission Impossible in fragments whenever it was on TV. So I'm familiar with the music in these films by reputation, but I was never really exposed to it in the way those composers intended. But that doesn't really matter, right? Because Beck here isn't trying to make a single reference to a specific film or film series. Over the years, this style of music has been referenced over and over and over again. That kind of music has just become the secret agent sound. Outside the play. Well, kind of got caught up in the moment. Well, hot side's 2020. Okay, Kowalski, your turn to pick up the slack. <laughs> But again, that's not what I got when I listened to Ant-Man, because when I first listened to Ant-Man, I didn't think of Secret Agent, I thought of The Incredibles. 
That's because when they made The Incredibles, they wanted to capture that James Bond aesthetic, so they had composer Michael Giacchino emulate Monty Norman's signature James Bond sound. And I've spent so much time looking at Giacchino's work from Pixar that that's how I heard Ant-Man's theme, which in a weird kind of backdoor coincidence sort of way made the Ant-Man theme sound even more like a superhero theme to me, which I guess is kind of convenient, but at the same time I feel like Beck wanted Ant-Man to be more like Secret Agent than Incredibles, which if that were true, would mean that I missed the intended message. Now I know that the answer I'm going to get from a lot of people is going to be some kind of death of the author. Well, you know, even if you hear something that the composer didn't intend, you're creating your own subjective interpretation of the music. <laughs> Which, yes, fine, that works for a lot of media. But in the world of media composition and soundtrack scoring, where most audiences are going to expect the music to help set the tone of a scene rather than tell its own story, missing the point of the music in a scene can be tonally confusing for the story at large. Like, me hearing The Incredibles instead of James Bond, making this feel more like Superman than Mission Impossible. Because that's the thing about analyzing music, it's never in a bubble, it's never cut and dry. The most dogmatic, draconian, and some other D word, the most intense musical argument in the world is still just someone saying, this is what I heard when I listened to this piece, this is what I thought the composer was doing, and here's why. But in an instance where a composer's trying to establish the tone of a scene by utilizing these musical associations, or references, or tropes, or cliches, whatever you want to call them, what happens? if you elicit one of these musical connections in your audience by accident? What happens if you remind your audience of something else without meaning to? Let's look at Captain Marvel's theme. When I first heard it, it immediately reminded me of something else. When you look at what I'm going to call as the most iconic segment of Captain Marvel's theme, you can see it rise in this opening leap of a minor seventh, then we have this descending and ascending motion, kind of like this valley structure, right before we reach a note that is an octave above the first note, and then we have this cadential structure, or at least we have the ending to the motif. The problem with that is that if you just take that description, a minor seventh up, a down and up structure, a note and octave above the first note, and then I guess like cadence, but if you just look at that description, especially when you look at just the first part of this motif, that's exactly what the opening to Star Trek does. To boldly go where no one has gone before. We get this opening of a minor seventh with what I'm calling a passing tone, a descending and ascending figure that finishes on a note an octave above where we began, and then some kind of cadential structure. Now, yeah, I can already see all the middle schoolers in the comment section saying stuff like, they're not even close, you're nitpicking, that doesn't prove anything. <laughs> Which just, please, just stop, just shut up. That's what I heard when I sat down and watched this film. I'll admit it, it's pretty subtle. But when I first listened to Captain Marvel's theme in the theater, my immediate thought was, huh, that kind of sounds like the opening to Star Trek to me, but more importantly, it sounds like the opening to The Next Generation instead of the original series because The Next Generation is the best Star Trek. That's right, I said it. Star Trek The Next Generation is the best series. At me. But they actually have the same opening. These are the voyages of the starship Enterprise. It's five-year mission to explore strange new worlds. It also didn't help that this entire film took place in space and in spaceships and had aliens and lasers. But I don't know how many other people heard that, or even if it was Pinar Toprek, the composer for Captain Marvel, or if it was her intention to elicit that kind of sound. Maybe she wanted a theme that reminded her of space, and so she turned to the greatest TV show ever made, Suck It Game of Thrones. Or maybe she just wrote something completely original, and it happened to remind me of Star Trek. Or maybe even she like subconsciously turned to a Star Trek sound. I don't know. That's a really great example of how subjective not only music is, with Beauty in the Eye of the Beholder and all that, but also how even analyzing music can be extremely subjective objective based on where you hear what happening when, and what you think the composer was trying to do, and for what reasons. And here we get into the weeds on how and why you may or may not listen to a piece of music, quote unquote, correctly. If the composer is trying to elicit a specific sound for a specific purpose in a very specific setting, and you, the listener, hear something else, is it possible that you heard that piece of music incorrectly? So, um, with that, let's get back to the portals. And let's talk about this whirlwind of awesomeness and confusion. So I think the first thing to address that I don't think anybody else has talked about yet is that um, this is Superman, or again, at least to me, this is Superman, or I think a better way of putting it is, I guess, like, this is proto-Superman. I'm serious. Have a seat. Break out the popcorn. This is going to be good. Okay, so we get this portal to Wakanda, and what do you hear? Boom. This bass drum. Followed by what? 
a solo trumpet. I think it might actually be a cornet, but hey, you do you. And then boom, 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 that bass drum again. Then we get the ensemble. Bass drum again. And the ensemble's more or less developing on what we heard the soloist playing. Now, let's see if this sounds familiar to anyone else. You start with this very specific bass drum pattern. A single brass line. Bass drum pattern. Then the ensemble comes in and supports and develops the soloist. Which is then, in a very similar way, cadenced by that bass drum pattern before the rest of the ensemble comes in. Now here's the thing, what feels like a decade and a half ago, I made a video about superhero themes. And in that video I talked about how this piece, Fanfare for the Common Man, as well as a lot of other works by the composer Aaron Copeland, served as an inspiration for John Williams' theme for Superman. You could hear it in the opening to the fanfare. You can actually see how Silvestri emulated this exact same style back in Captain America. So maybe Silvestri wanted to include proto-Superman in this film. Maybe he wanted a very classic heroic sound in this scene. Either way, with an audience that's arguably already familiar with that Superman sound, we get this new interpretation of the music that became Superman's theme. And I'd argue that looking at the arrangement of Copeland's fanfare for the common man, or at the very least emulating its structure, set this scene up for a really epic score. Now, on top of that awesomeness, this tune actually does something technical that I really, really enjoyed. It modulates. Well, it switches key centers. I don't want to get into if these are like modulations or tonicizations. Okay, just listen. The music changes keys. If you want to know more about how that works and what all that means, then you can check out this other video that I did on it here. Have I mentioned that I make other videos on this channel? I don't think I mentioned that yet. Like, comment, subscribe. Anyway, so this piece changes key signatures, which is a really great way of maintaining momentum in a piece of music. It's a classic songwriting technique. But... This piece changes keys six times. Oh gee, I wonder if the number six is significant to the Marvel Cinematic Universe. I wonder if the number six might have something to do with the central conflict of this scene and what's happening in this film. Maybe those six key changes are to represent the original six Avengers, and is totally ignoring how one of them totally isn't here right now and no one really noticed. Or maybe it's to represent the six Infinity Stones, who knows, but either way, it's crazy cool to see that in a scene like this. And through those key changes, the tune builds and builds until it climaxes with that super recognizable Avengers theme. <laughs> And here, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, and everyone in between, is when all this goes off the rails. See, if you listen to that initial motif, the central musical idea that develops into the rest of this piece, it kinda sounds familiar. You can almost say that it sounds like it could be a variation on that Thanos theme.
you can kind of see how the structures are similar, or at the very least, they begin the exact same way. And I can tell you that there are at least two people on Reddit that agree with me that this is a variation on Thanos' theme, so there, ha. Which, if that's the case, and that's how you hear it, then that's really cool, because then that makes this whole scene a musical response to what happened at the end of Infinity War. And if that's what you hear, fine. Or if it's just a completely brand new piece of music to you, that's fine too. It actually plays at the beginning of the film when Captain Marvel saves Iron Man, so maybe it's like the endgame theme to you or something. I don't know, you have to answer that question for yourself. And if these two themes are variations of one another, then my whole Captain Marvel theme sounds like Star Trek thing doesn't end up sounding so crazy, which is going to help me justify what I'm about to say. Because, um... None of that is what I heard. Like, in this Portals theme, I didn't hear this as a variation on Thanos' theme, and it didn't sound completely new, and only in rewatching it did I notice that it actually appears at the beginning of the film. See, when I was sitting in a theater and saw this for the first time, it stuck with me. Not because I thought it sounded cool, don't get me wrong, it does, it's awesome. But it stuck with me because that first moment, like that first little motif, that... It just kind of, okay, let me show you. Here are our notes, and I'll play them with my busted little sample library. Okay, great. So let's say that, oh, for no reason in particular, I wanted to repeat this note, like a bunch of times. while we're at it, why don't we get rid of this anacrusis right here? Okay, cool. So now let's say that instead of going down here, I wanted this note to go up instead of down, and I wanted it to be shorter. And instead of playing it in the brass, I want it to be in the piano. Well, here's what we get. Now, I'm not saying that Sylvester is a massive Linkin Park fan and that somehow made its way into the Avengers soundtrack in his own interpretation, but it does not help that this film is called Endgame and that that Linkin Park track is called In the End and that these are the first notes you hear in that song. I can't imagine that this is something that was done on purpose unless this is the most insane musical Easter egg ever put into a film ever ever like was he trying to play some kind of subconscious musical connection to get the audience to think that this is the end or have i just completely lost my mind and i've officially become a clickbait conspiracy theory youtuber i think we all know it's because i've lost my marbles maybe sylvester's operating on a higher plane of reality than the rest of us it really sounds like Linkin Park to me at the beginning, and that's what I mean when I say, I think I listened to this piece of music incorrectly. And that might not be how you hear it, or maybe through my back alley music analysis, I might have changed how you perceive this piece of music, which is a truly terrifying thought. Or maybe I have just completely lost my mind. It completely depends on how you hear it and what you make of it. Again, beauty's in the eye of the beholder. Music and music analysis is subjective. But that's the kind of stuff you have to keep in mind when listening to and analyzing music. Nothing's in a bubble. It's important to keep in mind what it can composer's intentions were when writing music. Otherwise, you can completely miss the point, especially when it comes to these scoring techniques that composers will utilize for films, TV shows, and video games. So yeah, to a lot of people, myself included, it sounds really, really epic, but at least the opening kind of sounds like Linkin Park to me. Maybe Sylvester did that on purpose to subconsciously make his audience think of a song that was about the end of something, or more likely it was just a coincidence. And Captain Marvel's theme reminds me of space, even though I start thinking about Klingons and not the Kree and the Skrull. And Ant-Man sounds more like a superhero to me than a secret agent, because in the first film, he was there to break into a building. He was a burglar. It was a heist movie. And then, I guess he was just, like, in the way in the second film. And then I guess his theme only really shows up in this one really small part in Endgame because now he's the guy that pees his pants and doesn't really know what's going on. But to be fair, when he's in the last scene and he gets giant and he punches the Leviathan, that's, that's really cool. But when it comes to establishing an argument to discuss how and why this piece of music sounds so awesome, there are a few things that I can 100% defend. This piece does have a very similar structure to the piece of music that inspired Williams' as Superman, and he did change key signatures six times, which is not only thematically significant to the story, but it helps the piece build and build to the climax of the MCU. And in all seriousness, if I was going to piece together an academic argument trying to explain how this motif came to be, I'd describe it as a variation on Thanos' theme, as a musical response to what happened at the end of Infinity War. So here's the thing, if I just went with my gut and stuck with what I thought this piece sounded like, I would have completely missed out on how it was a variation and answer to Thanos' theme. In the end, pun intended, I think that Linkin Park was an interesting coincidence, but nothing more. But if I hadn't stepped outside my bubble, I never would have seen that and never gained a better appreciation for what Sylvester did. I would have listened to this music incorrectly.
Thanks for watching. I'd like to thank all my patrons to make these videos possible. With a very special thank you to AFN Matt, Alec Kulkowski, Andrew Luke, Clara Tan, DJ Now Ananda, Dr. Will, Hayden Elza, Jordan Adams, Karen Rosano, and Who Am I? I'd also like to thank everybody who requested me talk about Endgame and why saxophones sound a certain way. I hope YouTube doesn't demonetize this video. If you like what you saw here, be sure to subscribe and check out my other videos. Follow me on Twitter and Twitch to have your musical questions answered live. And if you really like what I'm doing, then consider supporting the channel on Patreon. But that's all I got for now. Thanks for watching.